Today we're bringing you a flashback. We're looking back some 10 years at the events and personalities that shaped 1986. A year we may never forget. There were the stars. And the music makers. favorite TV shows. There was tragedy. And there was triumph. have Alex Trebek, the host of Jeopardy, to give us a 1986 trivia quiz throughout the whole show. Alex? Hi, Rolanda. This is Alex Trebek on the Jeopardy set in Los Angeles, and I'm absolutely thrilled to be part of your special program today. On the show today, all of our final Jeopardy categories have to do with things that occurred in 1986. So I'll come back in just a few moments to play Final Jeopardy with your audience. Okay. Thanks, Alex. We're going to have fun with that one. So join us for a look back at 1986, a year full of compassion, a year full of glamour, and tragedy turned to triumph. That's all on today's Rolanda. One event in the year 1986 that stands out, I guess, for all of us. Most of us can remember where we were when we heard the news of the tragic loss of the Space Shuttle Challenger and its crew. I remember I was reporting, I was a news reporter and anchor woman for WABC TV here in New York City. And I will never forget when we, when we got the news and just the, the pictures alone broke our hearts. It was very difficult even reporting the news. Um, it's one of those times where you remember you're not just a reporter, you're human too. For my first two guests, the loss was deeply personal. But they're here to tell us how tragedy can lead to triumph. I'd like you to welcome from Virginia Beach, Virginia, Jane Wolcott Smith. She is the widow of Challenger pilot Mike Smith. I'd also like you to meet Grace Corrigan from Framingham, Massachusetts. She is the mother of the first civilian to fly in the space shuttle program, school teacher Krista McAuliffe, who many of us remember. Welcome, ladies. Thank you so much for being with us today. I really appreciate it. I guess that an event that shaped so, I mean, just really affected so many of us, it was so personal to you. I, I could imagine, or I, I can't even imagine, watching the space shuttle go mm -hmm. up and then right before your eyes, just seeing all of those dreams dashed. How, how do you cope? How do you deal with that? What do you tell the children? <laughs> well, we got through it uh, by just doing, because so many things had to be done. The children, uh, the immediate children, were there, of course, and, and knew it had happened. and. Uh, there was just so much we had to take care of, and that's what you focused on. Mm -hmm. You had an awful lot of support. I know that the oh. nation... Oh, we had a great deal of support from the nation, and we were, we were uh, watching uh, the crew, immediate crew families were watching from the uh, roof of the Launch Control Center mm -hmm. at Kennedy. So we had 13 children on the roof wow. with us that day. And, and when the event happened and, and we knew, being a military wife, I, I sensed right away it, there had been a, a major malfunction. Uh, Mike, Mike had been a pilot and a test pilot and had also been an instructor in test pilot school and taught many of the astronauts in the past. Uh -huh. um, our children were just, as we were, devastated. We, we didn't know the whole country. We did not, at that time, realize the whole country was mourning with us. Mm -hmm. And, and we just, to this day, my children still want to thank everyone around the world who sent prayers mm -hmm. and 
wishes and what you learn about this country during that <laughs> the best <laughs> wonderful people <laughs> wonderful people yeah i know that vice president then vice president uh -huh. bush came to you and john right. glenn the former right. astronaut what words Jake of wisdom did, did they give you well they wanted to know what they came to the crew quarters where mm -hmm. uh they had take brought the families uh to to wait mm -hmm. we didn't know why we were waiting we were so busy trying to make some sense out of what had happened and um we had been debriefed by, by our friends at NASA. Uh, and when they arrived, they said, what do you want, what do you families want to happen? And we just said, well, the space program must go on. That's what our loved ones cared most about, that pioneering spirit, mm -hmm. the opportunity that this country provides each of us in, in our everyday lives. It, uh, NASA has affected that. For I understand this was Mike's dream that he always dreamed of, of, of do, you know, being in the, in the space shuttle, and that this was the the first was, first time. This was his first time, mm -hmm. and uh, he had always said if he either wanted to be the captain of a, a naval aircraft carrier or be the pilot of the space shuttle and he was and that was one of his dreams yeah. but as we all know we all have many dreams and and we all just have to do the best we can each day and some of us are very fortunate to have those opportunities and that's the way he felt yeah. truly truly blessed yeah you have moved on a lot has happened in the 10 <laughs> years uh, catch us up a bit <laughs> well, all the families are doing well and right after the tragedy we uh, wanted to do something for the children of the country and mm -hmm. for the teachers and so the families came together and we formed the Challenger Center for Space Science Education mm -hmm. and that's an exciting turn of events mm -hmm. uh, we we didn't know what to do way back then but that anyway that's what uh -huh. we Kristen, started. Kristen McAuliffe was the civilian on it, a school teacher mm -hmm. um, I, I just I can imagine that she's truly touched the, the lives of her students. You say that you wanted to make sure that her enthusiasm lived. What kind of a woman was Krista McAuliffe? Actually, she was exactly as you saw. Yeah. She uh, was exuberant. She loved life. She loved teaching. She was a wonderful mother, great daughter. Oh. She was like the girl next door. And I hear from people all over the world, and they'll tell me that they all felt as if they knew her. and. Uh, that's what she was like. Mm -hmm. You remarried. I remarried. You remarried so, one of Mike's classmates. I remarried. I, re <laughs> I married one of Mike's former classmates, right. uh, who was a graduate of the class of 1967 from the Naval Academy. So my name is really Smith Walcott. Uh huh. Now, did people say anything when you married a former classmate of his? No, not really. I have very good taste, and uh, <laughs> in, in men, in men, I, I in say men. That. You know, and and um, no, I think I, I like that. I really, uh, m my husband now uh, was a former naval pilot, mm -hmm. and he has many of the same qualities that I love so much that Mike had had, mm -hmm. and that Mike had instilled in our children as well. Mm -hmm. And those qualities are are being proud and being patriotic, uh, and having a great deal of perseverance, just loving life. Uh, it goes on and on, a lot of the uh, same qualities. Many of the astronauts are, are really that, that kind of people that you would like to have as your mother, father, sister, daughter. Uh, they're normal. Normal people. <laughs> very, very normal. Very courageous people. Very courageous. Who certainly, because of their sacrifice, have become our American heroes. When we come back, more of the stories and faces we remember from 1986, like Dixie Carter and Hal Holbrook. They're here from the 1986 hit Designing Women. They also met on that stage, so we'll talk about that. We also have a fashion show from the man who designed all those great dynasty dresses, Nolan Miller. I'm even wearing one myself. But next, we have another story of courage when Ryan White's mother joins us as we flash back to 1986. today back to the year 1986 and we've been talking to two women who lost loved ones in the Challenger space shuttle tragedy that many of us remember tremendously you know this the, the Challenger um, Center that 
that you're pulling together. Was that all the families who lost loved ones who pulled together and created a center? Tell us exactly what that is and, and what help you've been able to, to give. Go ahead. Well, that's, it's a simulated space shuttle and mission control. And children can come into this and have a simulated space flight. Wow. And, and it takes approximately two hours to complete it. And when they are finished, they've actually been able to probe the tail of Halley's Comet. Oh, really? Yeah, right. Oh, cool. And so sometimes they, they just get so enthused in what they're doing, they really feel that they ha are out of space. <laughs> Isn't that something? Oh, God. Uh -huh. Well, you know, um, I, I, think it's, I think that was a great way to turn events around because the tragedy, even though you lost loved ones, it was a tremendous tragedy for us, too. And I just wonder how you can still instill the, the triumph in the story oh. to children so they aren't afraid to dream of going to space and there's many wonderful things that have happened that have come from this but it's also things that um, actually they would be doing if they were still here too but there are uh, there's the Department of Ed McCullough Fellows mm -hmm. that gives scholarships each year to teachers all around the country That's and there's sabbaticals and uh, there's my, uh, Mike Smith scholarships. Oh, we have several uh, all of the astronauts uh, from their own schools have been yeah. uh, there are so many awards and honors given in their behalf that reach others. Uh, we're not so interested in remembering. I want everybody to remember the way he lived and how he cared and mm -hmm. what a wonderful father he was and a wonderful husband, but how he was a student and, and how thrilled they all are and were and the ones that are living. In our learning centers, the curriculum is written and given to the classroom teacher who teaches her students and they can and then they go fly a mission in our learning centers we have 30 around the country I like what you said though and that's as we remember 1986 to remember how these 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 great Americans lived that's not right. so much how they died that's, that's right. a good point that's and what I they would want that. that's always what oh, they that's want. what we want too that's I mean there's want. no there's nothing we could do to ha it had happened Right. And right. all we have now is to do something positive, which has happened. L let's talk about someone else who, who really turned tragedy into triumph, I think, who we learned an awful lot from. It was just a kid, a story that moved a nation. It put a human face on the AIDS epidemic. Now, remember back in 1986, folks, we didn't talk about AIDS the way we do today. So you can imagine what a challenge it was for a 15-year-old Ryan White to be not to be not allowed in school because he had contracted contracted the AIDS virus, the child was a hemophiliac. He had a blood transfusion, and, uh, and he accomplished so much in his short life, which ended in 1990. His mom is here joining us today from Cicero, Indiana. Ryan's mother, Jeannie White. Jeannie, come on and join us. <laughs> We've been talking out here, trying to find the positive, trying to find the triumph in tragedy. Um, there was so much that your child did for our understanding of AIDS, our compassion. If we remember anything about Ryan other than that, what could you tell us about the little boy who made a big difference? I think that he handled AIDS in a situation where people thought you had to do something bad or wrong to get the disease, otherwise you didn't get it. Mm -hmm. And people really didn't think that um, you could get AIDS. Uh, they thought you could get AIDS from kissing tears, sweat, and saliva. And for Ryan to see how the gay and the IV drug user community was being treated, and he was being treated the same way. And he was like, wait a minute here. You know, I have AIDS. And people thought you had to do something bad or wrong. And people thought Ryan somehow did something bad or wrong. Uh, otherwise, he wouldn't have got the disease. I think and showing everybody he, he didn't have to do that. I remember that you were telling us that it got so bad that even the public was saying things. That there must be something funny going on in that house that, that, that you must have given your child AIDS. Yes, people thought they... The world was really becoming very good friends with Ryan. The media was becoming to start the education. And people were pointing fingers really at me, saying that I was the bad mother. Somehow, funny business had to be going on in the house. There was things going on. I was a trashy housekeeper. They said, one, one lady called in and said that they knew me personally, and they knew that that's how, how Ryan had gotten AIDS, because I was so dirty. Mm. And I mean, you just had to live with a lot of um, 
people criticizing and ridiculing you. You're right. I also understand that the media was very tough on you, that they got to a point where they were peeking through the windows and that you couldn't even go to the grocery store without people following you. Well, I think the media was a pain. But at the same time, I think they were our educators. Mm -hmm. They showed the nation that here was a young boy battling this disease, and he was doing it with such dignity and grace, and people started listening. So the media helped Ryan really get the message out that you couldn't get it from kissing tears, sweat, and saliva, mm -hmm. and that uh, you did not have to be gay or IV drug user, that anybody could get this disease. Mm -hmm. Ryan. I understand, never complained, was never bitter, never asked why me, mom, never did any of that? Behind the scenes, no. he had to, come on. When no, you no, he didn't. And I would say, Ryan, how can you be so nice to all these people all the time? And he would say, mom, they're just trying to protect their own kids like you're trying to protect me. And he said, if you don't know about something, you're going to be afraid of it. That's yeah. why we have to teach them not to be afraid of me. Isn't that something? Yeah. Isn't that so. something? You know, I, I remember the, that he had been diagnosed originally to have only a few months to live. And somehow that kid stuck it out for five more years. It makes you wonder sometimes if you think he might have been planted here with a divine purpose. Do you ever think things like that? Uh, Ryan? had a lot of faith and he said the Lord came and spoke to him and told him he had nothing to fear that he was going to be taken care of really? and I used to kind of I said Brian well what did he look like <laughs> you know? I said, Brian, you sure it wasn't a doctor or a nurse dressed in a white gown or something and he said no mom he said but he told me I had nothing to fear and I saw such an inner peace with him after that mm -hmm. so he had a lot of spiritual faith and I think he um, from that point on, he said, thank you, Lord, for another day, because they gave him three months to live, and they said he could live six. He was diagnosed with full-blown AIDS. Mm. And so he was HIV probably positive probably maybe six years before we even knew that he had it. But because mm. he was one of the first children and first hemophiliacs to come down with it, it started a whole new investigation into Factor A and the the product with it, with the, with that that the hemophiliac community was infected by. Mm. I think the one thing I think that we all learned through that was compassion, because that child belonged to all of us, really did. Thank you. Later in this show, we're going to give you an address if you'd like to write the Ryan White Foundation. Coming up, we also have Cindy Adams, who's going to update us on our favorite celebrities from 1986. What are they doing now? But first, join Alex Trebek for our 1986 edition of Rolanda Jeopardy! <laughs> Rolanda, this is something all of you folks should do well with. The category for Final Jeopardy is TV Trivia. The Final Jeopardy answer is... This show, nominated for 16 Emmys in 1986, starred a die-hard actor and a blonde bombshell. If you said, what is moonlighting, then you're absolutely right. We'll have another Final Jeopardy for you in a little while. Thanks, Alex. And we had a winner up here. You get a Rolanda t-shirt, man. Raise your hand. <laughs> That's great. We have been talking about 1986 today, some of the big events of 1986. And of course, there was the Challenger shuttle that exploded. And there was also uh, Ryan White, who we lost, um, who taught us so much compassion when it comes to AIDS. I know that a lot of stars got behind uh, the, the struggles that we were going through to help, I guess, relieve the nation of the grief that we were feeling because of your lost loved ones. I know that John Denver did a, sh did a song about the... For the 51-hour crew. For the crew, I see, for mm -hmm. the shuttle. And Michael Jackson did um, a song for Ryan. Yes, it was called Gone Too Soon. Gone Too Soon. Mm -hmm. He had made Ryan a promise that he could be in his next video. Mm. And when Ryan died, that could not be done. So he called me and told me that um, he was still going to do a video on Ryan, even mm. though Ryan could not be in one of his. Wow. Mm. Well, 1986 was a big year in entertainment, and here to tell us the celebrity scoop, past and present, who was who, what they were doing, and what they're doing now, is entertainment reporter Cindy Adams. Come on out, Cindy. Hello. <laughs> How are you? I love these I baubles. Love oh, I like thank you. Nolan Miller. 
Nolan Miller. Do I get that jacket you, too? Listen, you know I gave Cindy Adams a jacket on this very show last season. Yes. I'm afraid for Cindy to come on. You might want to take my Nolan Miller. That's how I get most of my clothes. I'm glad to sit down. You know, standing there, you have to suck in your stomach. I'm so glad. To sit. <laughs> you look great, Cindy. You. you look fantastic. 1986. Who are the biggest stars, and what are they doing now? Well, there was Imelda Marcos, of whom you may recall. You know, the biggest <laughs> shoes in captivity. Right. She is right now living in Manila. She is a congresswoman, and she is still trying to locate something like $500 million, which she seems to have mislaid. <laughs> the Philippine government would like to know where it is. Probably in her shoes. Well, I don't know where she is. But she also has an entire ship made of gold, which she what? seems to have, they mislaid it. You know, you know how you misplace things like that. <laughs> so she's looking for that. That's what Melda is doing. There was also running really hot was, um, Sarah Ferguson, remember? I mean, mm -hmm. she was really terrific. She came over here recently. We had lunch together, and she served me some uh, runny chopped egg sandwiches, and they were <laughs> drooling down the things. We were both eating. I mean, for me, it's fine when I eat with my husband and my visit his relatives in the Bronx. We all dribble like <laughs> But you don't really expect a queen's relatives are going to do that. Right. By the way... <laughs> Can I ask you, what do you think the queen has the schleps in that handbag? What is that thing with that <laughs> stupid handbag? Do you know what's in it? Well, I know it's not mad money. <laughs> it's not bus token. It's not rumpled Kleenex. She uses a lousy, junky kind of cake powder in a crappy thing. I've seen it. So she has that. She has a handkerchief. And she also uses it, Rolanda, as a, as a prop. When she is talking to somebody boring, as you might be talking to me, <laughs> no. and you want me off, and you can't say, get rid of her, she's boring. So what the queen did is, if, if it's hanging here, she shifts it to this arm. And that means for her equerries, you know, get me away from this peasant wow. or whatever it is. Oh, so she uses good. it. Everybody's going to be switching their purses on dates now. If I Thank switch you. my purse, Thank get me out of this much. date, okay? <laughs> so that was one of those. Uh, who was another? Joan Rivers. Joan Rivers was on television every 10 minutes back mm -hmm. then. She is now making fortunes, uh, pressed down and running over with some schmatas she's selling on QVC <laughs> or Home Network or jewelry or what. Yeah. She just bought one of those paintings from Jackie O's garage sale, remember that? Yeah. She paid like $25,000 for something that's a buck and a quarter anywhere else. <laughs> and what she has done is she has copied it and it's now going to come out in, in oh little um, brooches and little all kinds of things mm -hmm. and, and scarves. She's also getting married to a guy called Oren Lehman, mm -hmm. who gave her a sapphire this size. Oh, gosh. <laughs> so one of the things she loves about him is that he's not broke. And um, <laughs> uh, there were... Who's Molly Ringwald. Molly Ringwald. Yeah. Oh, Molly Ringwald is coming back again. Molly Ringwald is now doing a TV series. She has just finished decorating an apartment in New York. Mm. She has just finished decorating an apartment in Paris because she has a guy over there. She is now decorating an apartment in Beverly Hills. And at the break of the hiatus in December or something, she's going to Miami where she's making some cockamamie movie. I don't remember the name of it. <laughs> I don't care either. But she's going to be decorating a little place there. In the meantime, she is shopping at Hermes for this guy. She, he must be great, the guy over in Paris, because she was buying him a sweater, which is $900. Well, she didn't switch her purse, girls. <laughs> <laughs> so she is doing very, very well. How has life changed for you since 1986? Well, I, my face can't take a close-up like it did in 1986. <laughs> It's a thing called laugh lines. You know what those are? Those are, they're laughing even when you're not. <laughs> the other day I waved goodbye to somebody. This part of my arm stopped waving 10 minutes later. <laughs> so that's basically how life has changed for me. Oh, I make a little more money. I get clothes secondhand from you. <laughs> I'll talk I'll to you after the, the show. I'll <laughs> take the suit. Don't stain it. I'll take it. <laughs>
Coming up next, two of the biggest stars in 1986 and still today, Dixie Carter and Hal Holbrook. But now, one of the things that helps evoke a time or place is always a little music. And to bring us all back to 1986, here's New Jersey singing sensation, The Nerds, with one of 1986's top ten songs, Remember, Addicted to Love. Here they are. Hit it, guys. Charlene, I realize that different people have different definitions of what is obscene. I myself may not be able to define pornography, but I know it when I run over it. The year was 1986, and one of the hottest new shows while we were snapping our fingers to Addicted to Love was a comedy called Designing Women. And playing the part of the ever so refined Julia Sugarbaker was actress Dixie Carter. And playing her love interest both then and now is actor Hal Holbrook. Come on out, Dixie and Hal. Southern women, huh? Hello, how are you? <laughs> nice to meet you. Julia Sugarbank, isn't that great? You look great. You look. Thank you. Now I understand you guys did not actually meet on the set. Is that right? No, we met before. We, yeah. met we were before. married by the time Designing Women started. Oh, okay. Yeah. How did you meet? Richard and Jean met on the show, and Delta and Mac met on the show. But we met doing a. A television movie for CBS. Oh, called okay. The Killing of Randy Webster. On another set. No, I had him. I had him married by the time Design Women started. <laughs> good thing. Good thing. Good for. How did you? How did you get him? I went sailing. <laughs> I went sailing out in the ocean with him. She and went out of her way. Him. She went out of her way. She she well, give us some way. tips. She went how all the way to New Zealand in the sailboat. Yeah. Whoa. With me. Yeah. Yes, she did. I like your taste in Southern women. There. I I thought she liked sailing, but then she found out later I found out that she she actually said that she really did that to hook me can you imagine what? anybody sailing to New Zealand to uh, hook me I said well you should be complimented that I cared that much that I would go to those lengths that's right how did you know that, that you were the right ones for each other what was the one thing where you said I'm gonna marry that lady I think I, I think girls do the knowing of that kind of thing. My daddy says it's a, a hopeless situation for a man if a girl sets his cap, sets her cap for him. He's dead. She's going to get him. If she wants him, she's going to get him. Oh, I think that was well. our situation. You gave me a little tiny lead in there. What I, think, I do? Very small. To talk about my book. You said oh. what are your tips? What are your tips? See, I talk about that. And the book is called Trying to Get, trying to, to, heaven. get to Heaven. And I talk about my sailing trips with Hal in the book. Mostly it's about my family 
and how I believe that our families are our greatest treasure and are uh, the source certainly of whatever strength we're going to have to get through the things we have to get through in life. And you have two families, daughters. As witnessed by these, these ladies who are, have just been on the show. It was so moving. Yeah, yeah it was. So moving to watch you We were you watching all. off so, stage. It was, it was very wonderful touching. To, to be on the show with you. It's a privilege. Mm -hmm. um, so my book is about the kinds of things that these ladies exemplify. The sorts of, uh, of I hate to use that word, values that we've heard used so much. It's okay. But, we haven't heard of them lately. Let's, but, let's talk about them for sure. But the things that are important to some of us, mm -hmm. which have to do with the corny things called home and hearth, mm -hmm. and love of country, and, and appreciation for our, our folks. Yeah. And uh, so I wrote a book that Hal encouraged me to write for Simon & Schuster, and it, it's all about those kinds of things, with a few tips about how to get your man. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. You have two daughters, is that right? <laughs> two girls. Two Harvard yeah. girls. He's got three children. I have three. Mm -hmm. He's got one girl, Eve, the same age as my girl, Mary Dixie, and then I have a daughter, Mary Jenna. Mm -hmm. So there's Eve and Mary Dixie and Jenna, all three, right, the, uh, within a year of each other. A whole new set of designing women, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, Rolanda. Well, how was it? Why do Southern it? What? ladies always have two names? I don't know. <laughs> Mary Dixie. The I don't daughter know. One in, is not enough. One, so. <laughs> in my case, I wanted to name my second baby after myself. I named the first one after my mother, and wanted to name the second one after my <laughs> Dixie. And her father, to whom I'm no longer married, said, "You cannot put that name on that child without something to help it along. Something to soften it." <laughs> so he's the reason I put Mary, which is my aunt's name, in front of Dixie. <laughs> Let's take a quick flashback now to 1986. Here's a scene from Designing Women. For the past 48 hours, I have endured in this loony bin. I have witnessed every debauchery allowed under the Napoleonic Code. <laughs> well, this is the last straw. Where are you going? Hey, 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 New Orleans. I am Julia Sugarbaker. And I'm gonna go sleep in Anthony Bouvier's room. I am white, he is black. We are not engaged. And he is significantly younger than I am. So just put that in your etouffee and chug on it. <laughs> now, Hal, is that a lot more Dixie or Julia Sugarbaker? Now, what? Is that I'm is Dixie like that? Is Dixie like that in real life? <laughs> Once in a while, you got to get out of the way. To get out of the way. That's, did that's, you? Did the character Julia Sugarbaker teach you anything? Or did it give you? Or, was, or is it just a totally different character that might no, have helped? No, I learned a lot from Julia. I think Julia got a little softer because of me. But I, I learned a, uh, a little bit about being a, just a sticking up for myself a little more, being a little bit more confrontational. Yeah, uh, uh, you can't have that kind of wonderful writing for seven years put in your mouth without mm -hmm. benefiting from it, mm -hmm. I think. Why was the show so popular, you think? Because I was one of those. I wouldn't miss it. Well, we girls got to start. I think the women in this country, Southern women loved the idea that Southern women were depicted as something other than sitting on the front porch in their slips, scratching. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> and women all over the country were happy to see women portrayed as uh, with just a little bit more than a room temperature IQ. So, right. And then women got their men folks to, everybody's got two TV sets in their house now, I guess. So for the first year, the men were still watching Monday Night Football, mm. you know. But then the women got to, and the men were intrigued by these smart mouths. Mm -hmm. Women, and they started watching too. I think we learned that word on TV during the eighties too. <laughs> um, I just wanted to ask you: did, did people get along? I mean, you got all those women on the set, and we heard there was a lot of drama backstage. Did, were there a lot of cat fights and things going on? Let me just tell you that I even in the most difficult uh, times, when the, when the uh, things were going on and the National Enquirer was running pieces. On, when we were on that stage acting together, everyone was perfectly professional. It's remarkable, but it's true, and Hal can witness mm -hmm. to that. Yeah, it was. It's a, a tremendously sad thing, so I don't talk about it, Rolanda, the, mm -hmm. the breakup of the original four. Mm -hmm. It's a, a permanent heartbreak uh, for me, I'm sure, for all of us. Mm 
Yeah. Um, because we had something that was magical between us yeah. and very special. We regarded each other so highly. We were so tickled by each other. We weren't jealous. We weren't. We were healthily competitive, but we were so in love with each other's performing. And it's a shame. It's yeah. so rare to, to get four actors together with that kind of chemistry. I mean, mm -hmm. that really is magic. It's, you can't buy it, you can't find it, it just has to happen. Yeah. Hal said when he would come on the show as a guest, <laughs> that he would, everybody was relaxed all week long, yeah. and then the day of the taping would come and he said it was like being let into a cage of pumas. Yeah, <laughs> it was. He said the uh, four of us would come out with our hair teased up <laughs> <laughs> and our makeup on. Yeah, yeah. It, was, it was scary. Well, I bet you. <laughs> I mean, they, they talked fast, they knew, bang, bang. Oh, <laughs> well, I bet Julia Sugarbaker would certainly want to be around for our next segment. Designer Nolan Miller is here, and he's brought some of his fabulous clothes from Dynasty. He even let me wear one today. <laughs> We've got a Fem Fatale fashion show for you coming up next. And here's another Jeopardy question coming up. Hit it, nerds! Rolanda, we're now going to test you on the subject of history. That's our final Jeopardy category. Here's the clue for you. In 1986, this New Yorker celebrated her 100th birthday with a party that included a 28-minute fireworks display. The correct question, what is or who is the Statue of Liberty? Did you get it? You had it? Yeah, a lot of people in the audience knew that one. Very good. He had it. Everybody had it. <laughs> and now they want Rolanda t-shirts. All the winners get Rolanda t-shirts. I was trying to think. Let's see. Lillian Gibson. While you're wearing that t-shirt, think about what they were wearing back in 1986. Y'all remember Dynasty? I didn't miss a Dynasty. Didn't miss it. I, and didn't you ever wonder what it would be like just to be that rich and wear all of those fabulous Nolan Miller? dresses well dressing Linda Evans and Joan Collins on that hot 1980s TV show was only one highlight of his 40-year career designing for women please welcome Beverly Hills own Nolan Miller welcome. you are a very handsome man Nice, thank you. You know, we know, we hear the name Nolan Miller, but when you walked out, you're tall and handsome and all of those oh. things. You must have had fun working with all those women. Oh, always, always <laughs> love working with them. How was it working with Linda and Joan? I mean, did they ever get like jealous? Yeah, her dress looks better than mine. No, actually, it's amazing. But everyone was pretty friendly on the show, much like their show it's it's uh, the stories of course said otherwise and and i guess the cat fights when they ended up in the swimming pool or in the lily pond in the mud you, you know, remember that carried oh, we over to the national to Enquirer, that's... but yeah. not 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 in reality would you remember when they said slap each other and they're getting all those fights? i've got to ask you this when you're watching and they're fighting like cats don't you go, my clothes, my clothes, don't tear the clothes. No, not really, because they were, the clothes were planned for those things. I mean, uh, when, when they were in the lily pond, I had made six of each, each uh, outfit. Whoa. And, uh, and unfortunately, when, when they tore a sleeve out, it was arranged, it was a breakaway so that it was fixed with Velcro so it would tear. And wow. It wasn't for real. It, it was wasn't for real. It was all, all planned. All of those that were designed to tear. You're not so, only yes, designed to, yes, to look yes. glamorous, but designed to get in a fight in case But you I must to. say, that show, more than anything else, I mean, every show that I have done, um, I would get a phone call. When I was doing Charlie's Angels, Aaron Spelling would phone me from the projection room when he was seeing dailies. Nolan, what are you doing? Why is Jacqueline Smith in a fur coat? What the <laughs> hell is going on? You know, I would get all of this. Nobody ever told me on Dynasty that anyone was overdressed. I could do anything I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> but believe it or not, Joan used to say, do you think we're going over the top a bit? And I'd say, no. Nah. <laughs> Of all people to say it. Well, let's see some of the fashions that made Dynasty such a hit. And would you comment on each of sure. the fashions that we're seeing? Let's take a look. We have the real. Woo! First of all, I had the largest wardrobe budget of, for a show that any show in the history of television has what had. What was it? We well, uh, my basic budget was thirty thousand a week, but I usually Whoa. went around fifty, and sometimes even more. Aaron would always accuse me of trying to bankrupt the studio. <laughs> this was a dress made for Linda Evans. 
Oh, she always had the V and the big shoulders. Yeah. Oh, she, yeah. Her shoulders are enormous, so uh, uh, we had to do anything Ooh, we could. When you see the old film, sometimes her shoulders were wider than John Forsythe's. Wow. And this is the only time that we used a dress made for someone else on Dynasty. I originally made this for Elizabeth Taylor when she was oh. guest star on Hotel. And uh, it was in the wardrobe department, and I needed something desperately, so we put oh it on, my on Joan. It takes your breath away to see these. We made this for Joan Collins, and the cost of it was about $12,000, and they cut the scene. So I was desperate to find a place to use it to... to um, how about the Rolanda show? Why I used this much. <laughs> so we used it in a little scene about two seconds long. Oh my goodness. What incredible. And of incredible. course this was, was uh, for Joan also. Wow. Unbelievable. I don't know how Joan didn't get bronchitis. She was never covered up. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to talk more with Nolan Miller in just a minute. And we're going to see what Nolan Miller has designed for 1996. And I want to talk about glamour 1996 style and now one of the 1986 top dance hits remember word up by cameo well here it is nerd style <laughs> There's somebody on the set who's wearing Nolan Miller other than me. Can you find your pants? I mean, her, your. <laughs> Dixie's wearing Nolan Miller pants. It's me. <laughs> Should I say she's in my pants? <laughs> she's in your pants, Nolan. I don't know. No. Now, let me ask you this. Did the, did the girls get to keep those outfits? Did Joan Collins and those get to, to keep them? Or no, the, the wardrobe always belonged to uh, the production company. However, Linda was very nice. She would say, would you ask Mr. Spelling if I could please buy this and this and this? And they would sell it to them like for a fraction of what it cost to make. But Joan Collins, she would say, I'm taking this tonight. <laughs> And, and when she would finish shooting a scene, and if we were finished with the wardrobe, she took it home. And even now, uh, recently, Joan brought some things to me and said, could you alter these clothes that I stole from Dynasty? <laughs> alter them, them which way? Them Take them out. Take them out? <laughs> no. You don't tell those things. Shorten the skirts. And, oh, you know, I things. see. I understand. <laughs> <laughs> No, no. Trust mother. <laughs> Trust mother. I understand that at some point that, that Joan Collins even got to a point where she was like, with Diane Carroll would have a dress on and she'd say, uh-uh, that's an Alexis dress. Get her out of that dress. Would you make that many clothes over that many years? In the, originally, everyone had a very definite look and, and it was a very definite look how Linda looked, how Joan looked, how Diane looked. But it started all blurring together. I made so many clothes. and. Occasionally, Joan would say, why is Diane wearing that? It looks like a Lexus. <laughs> but, uh, what are we going to uh, see in 96 for, for style and fashion? Well, I do a couture collection, which is in uh, uh, very exclusive boutiques. Uh -huh. And uh, hopefully, well, I think I always like to see women look glamorous and beautiful. Uh, that's the reason I wanted to become a designer. And mm -hmm. uh, so my couture collection is very successful. and. Fortunately, there are enough women that still want to look glamorous. That, Absolutely. That, uh, Bring back that glamour, for goodness sake. Okay, trivia experts, here's one more Jeopardy question. Take it away, Alex. All right, Rolanda, this is our last final Jeopardy. It's sort of a makeup for uh, those people who missed the earlier two clues. The category right now is holidays. Here is today's final Jeopardy. 
This day was celebrated for the first time as a national holiday on January 20th, 1986. Now, if you didn't come up with what is Martin Luther King Jr. Day, then you should leave the studio immediately. <laughs> Alanda, thanks. Thank you. Right. So long, folks. <laughs> Thank you so much, Alex Trebek. We're all Big Jeopardy fans, and we're watching you. And by the way, remember, you have to say, what is Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.? Okay. Well, let's see what Nolan Miller is creating for 1996. The man says he wants to keep glamour on us, so without further ado, please, Nolan, why don't you tell us, show us what you have there. Okay. Whoa! Oh my goodness. These are from my suit collection, and the pin that she's wearing was a diamond pin that Joan Crawford owned. So I do a collection of, of, of jewelry for QVC now, and I've, I've done jewelry inspired by legends. Oh. And this was Joan Crawford's pen. The suit is, is from a silk, it's a cocktail suit. And of course you can this tell. This is a lot like this, absolutely. Go girl. Oh, <laughs> beautiful, yeah. just beautiful. Oh, this is, mm -hmm. look at that. Wow. This is one of the new evening gowns, which um, someone is wearing at the Emmys uh, this who? year. Who, who, who? Uh, Famke Jansen. Oh. From from um, um, what movie? Mission I love Impossible. how you, you you almost look. You gotta have attitude when you wear a dress like this. Look at this, unbelievable. And this is lace and satin. It's all cut on the bias, so it uh, there's no way to hide any figure flaws in this dress. What inspires you? Is there something? Is there is there something that you do that's ritual or something to get your creative juices going? Um. Thinking about uh, women, thinking about glamour, thinking I look at a piece of fabric and I think, oh, it's funny because my entire career has been uh, in film up to this point. So even when I'm doing a collection uh, for Ready to Wear, I still have to put a face to it. I think, what would I do for Lana Turner? What would I do for Joan Crawford? What would I do for somebody else? And I think about this and, and I need a script to tell me what they're going to wear. So, yeah. so I uh, uh, visualize someone in it. Well, what was so funny is I learned that you also did Green Acres. Oh, yes. Could you believe that? Some of the ones that you wouldn't oh, think. Green Acres and, and sure. Charlie's Angels. Is and the amazing thing now is Nick at Night has Honey West on, which is one of my first shows. And now all of a sudden it's, it's a, a big uh, yeah. cult thing. Right. 30 series, I think you've and done. 30 to 50, right? Yeah, uh, somewhere between 30 and 50. That's incredible. Absolutely yeah. incredible. Well, yeah, we'll I was continue. pretty lucky. Yeah, I would say. Well, luck is a product, you might say, of design. <laughs> we'll take another look back in 1986 in just a moment. Yeah. These are beautiful. like to thank everybody who helped with the show. Our panel of guests was just remarkably great. I really appreciate you. And I was just talking to these three guys. You guys were how old in 1986? Six. Six. And <laughs> six years old. And I asked him, I said, did you learn anything from today's show? And this guy says, yeah, to hang out with Nolan Miller with all those women. <laughs> so I'd like to thank you all. And nerds, come on and play us out. And thanks for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Oh